Tonight, I told you I'm going to preach a salvation message. I'm going to preach a message to a sinner going to hell. And uh, sometimes Christians have a tendency to say, well, that's not me. And I don't have to worry about that because I'm going to heaven. I'm saved. And so that doesn't apply to me. Well, that's not true. That's not true. Uh, for a second, before I get into my message, uh, I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Ephesians. Turn to the book of Ephesians. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray tonight that you'd please speak to every heart here. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to the heart of the Christians, Father. I pray that you'd speak to their heart and show them how important salvation is and how important it is that they enjoy their salvation. And, Father, I pray that you would uh, please speak to their heart. I pray that they, uh, the Christians here would make a great divide between the saved and the lost, Father. And, Lord, if there's anybody here tonight that's on the road that goes to hell, Father, I pray that that you would open up their eyes, Lord. I pray that you would open up their heart, Lord. And I pray tonight would be the night of salvation for their soul. Lord, I pray that they would be born again and trust your Son, Jesus Christ, nothing short of receiving him as their personal Savior. And I pray that would be this evening. In Jesus' precious name I pray, and for his sake, amen. Now, uh, I, I want to preach on salvation. That's basically my message. But I want you to know as a Christian how important it is for you to always be studying salvation. Never quit studying salvation. Never quit studying it. Study it all your life. Get everything you can about it. You say, it's very simple, preacher. Yeah, but there's a lot involved in salvation. 
There's a lot of things that's included in salvation. The better you know it, the easier you are, the better you are to get a man from going to hell to going to heaven, and you want to have it down pat, 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 so you can give it to the first guy that comes across. Amen. So get down. Don't you miss what's here for you tonight. Ephesians now. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Pick up verse 14. It says, Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Who's that talking about? That's talking about the Christian soldier. How many of you are a Christian soldier? Say amen. amen. You ladies, how many of you are Christian soldiers? Say amen. amen. And I'm real loud now. Come on, ladies. You're a Christian soldier. <laughs> I guess they call it a whack, but <laughs> you're a Christian soldier nevertheless. Say amen. 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 All right. Now, verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now watch it. And your feet shod with the... Now what's that word right there? Everybody say it. Preparation. preparation of the gospel of peace. What does that mean? What does the preparation of the gospel mean? That means that you're to get pe prepared in the scripture. That means you're to study the Scripture. That means that you're to meditate upon the Scripture and you're to get a whole bunch of verses on how to get a man saved. That's the preparation. So if I give a gospel invitation, which I will this evening, that any one of you, any one of you could come down to this aisle, open up your Bible, and give folks scripture on how to be born again and how to be saved. That's the preparation of the gospel of peace that's given to the Christian soldier. And you are all a soldier. So make sure, make sure you don't miss a word I say this evening aimed at an unsaved man. All right, now take your Bible. And turn to the book of Exodus. The name of my message tonight. Turn to the book of Exodus. The name of my message tonight is. Uh, whose side you on? Whose side you on? Now you say what do you mean? When I was a little boy. you in school. We was always doing this. Cross that line. And I'm going to clean you a plow. And we drew a line. And he was on that side of the line, and I was on this side of the line. And I wouldn't fight as long as he didn't cross that line. But the second he crossed that line, it was time to fight. Where is he at? He was on that side, and I was on this side. I will ask you, whose side you on? Whose side you on? If you're here tonight, you're lost. You're on one side or the other. And you're not in between, and there is no in between, and that gap is so far apart, you can't even talk about how far apart that gap is. It's a million miles apart between the man that's going to hell and the man that's going to heaven. They are not close like that, and there is no in between. You know what an unsaved man thinks? He thinks he's in between. Well, preacher, I'm not going to heaven, but preacher, I'm not going to hell either. And you're totally wrong. You're totally wrong. He's totally wrong by thinking he's in between. He's not in between. He's going to hell, and he's going to hell like a bullet, and he's going to burn, baby, burn, unless he repents and gets right with God. All right, now, look at it. Exodus chapter 32. Now, are you there? Say Amen. All right, in the book of Exodus, in uh, chapter 32, verse 26, it says, Then Moses, if you're there, say, say I, some of you are still turning. <laughs> that some of you is me. <laughs> Exodus 32. Exodus 32, 26. And it says, 
Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, now underline it, who is on the Lord's side? Now, if you know Exodus 32, Moses had went up on the mount, he'd got the Ten Commandments, and he'd got the Ten Commandments from God, and God wrote them on stone with his finger and gave them the first thing that was ever written. The Ten Commandments is a great thing. And then he gave it to Moses, and Moses come down off the Mount Sinai. And when he come down off the Mount Sinai, look what he saw. Look what he saw in verse 25. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, and Aaron had made them naked, and their shame was among their enemies. And you know what the children were able to do? They were down there and they were having a big old drunken party. And they were, up there, they were all naked and running around there. And all hell was breaking loose. While Moses was up there getting the commandments. He was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. And they just apostated against God down there on the ground. And the Lord says, wow, man, Moses, you don't know what they're doing down there. I mean, Aaron's got them all drunk and they're worshiping a golden calf. And when Moses came down to the bottom of the mount, he drew a line. He drew a line and he said, Who's on the Lord's side? He hollered and screamed that. Now look what happens. Now underline it. Who is on? Who is on what? Who is on whose side? The Lord's side. The Lord's side. One of these days, one of these days in the past, I got saved and I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior and I got on the Lord's side. And I'm on the Lord's side. And I've been on His side. And if you're saved, you've been on the Lord's side. And if you're not saved, you're not on the Lord's side, boy. You ain't on His side. No matter how you kid yourself. And there's a great gap in between and you're in trouble. Unless you get saved, you're in trouble. Now, look at what it says. Who is on the Lord's side? Uh, Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And I said unto them, Now take your pen and line it. Thus saith the Lord God. Now, is, is, is Moses telling the truth? Say Amen. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from the gate to gate, and uh, throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of the Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell from the people that day about 3,000 men. So what did they do? He said, who's on the Lord's side? And the Levites came over, stepped across that line. And then Moses said, by the power of God and for the voice of God, he said, take that sword and draw that sword and kill everybody who's on the other side of the line. You know what they did? They took the sword and then the Levites killed everybody on that side. 3,000 of them died. You say, what for? God is a great divider. God is a great divider. And God wants you to know that an unsaved man and and a saved man are not alike. There's a great separation between the two. And we have a world today that everybody's putting, they're getting the, the Christian, they're getting him, and they're getting him to walk like an unsaved man and act like an unsaved man, talk like an unsaved man, and then they're getting the the uh, unsaved man to talk like a Christian and act like a Christian and walk like a Christian and get them up just close like that and nobody can tell the two apart. You can't tell who's a Christian and who shouldn't be, who's not a Christian. They're just like that. Brethren, that should not be so. There's a great gap between the two of them. You know what preachers are saying now? Listen to me. They're saying... We need to be saved. We need to be born again. No, we don't. I'm born again. I'm saved. I don't need to be born again. I don't need to be saved. You need to be saved. Not me. I'm already saved. 
What's the preacher saying weep for? You know why he's saying weep? He wants a sinner to feel good. Come on, feel good, fella. Come on, feel good. I don't want you to feel bad. I don't want you to have a bad feeling. I want you to feel good. I want you to stay here. Why should you make the sinner feel good? That's the wrong feeling he should have. He shouldn't feel good. You know, it's like this. It's like this. I had a whole row of lost sinners come in about three weeks ago in my church, and they all sit in one pew. And I preached right at them. I said, you're going to go to hell. You're going to burn, baby, burn. And I pointed his finger right at them. You say, what? And that girl got up, and she left. And she said, Preacher, you scare me. Now that's the right feeling. You ought to have the right feeling. And the right feeling for a sinner is to be scared. He has reason to be scared. Why does he have reason to be scared? All he has to do is die. All he has to do is die. In his lost condition. And the two angels will come. And take that man. And take him out of his body. And take him. And put him in hell. Right then. That very minute he dies. And then he will be in hell. Screaming for God's mercy. And there will be no mercy. There's no mercy. In hell for a sinner. He's got to get to mercy here and now. You say, I'll get it in hell. You won't get it in hell. Not from God, you won't. There is no mercy there. Look at here. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Romans. Now, whose side are you on, Moses said? Who is on the Lord's side? There's a great gap between the two of them. Now take your Bible and turn to the book of Romans. I want to give you a great verse. A great verse as a Christian to try to point that sinner, that lost sinner, that man that's gone to hell. And it's a great verse in trying to show him his need of salvation. You know what's wrong with a sinner? He don't realize his true condition. If, I get a, if we had a sinner in this building tonight, I don't know if we do or we don't or not, but if we did, we had one here. Just suppose we do. And we had one right by. You know what he'd say? He'd probably say this. Well, preacher, I really don't want you to call me a sinner. I don't appreciate you calling me a sinner because I'm not a sinner. I don't sin. Now, to prove that point, how many of you saved people will say, preacher... I'm saved, but I'm a sinner. Amen. See that? See that? Did you get that? A sinner says, oh man, I'm not a sinner. I'm a pretty good fella. I'm not bad. I'm not, I'm not really unholy. I'm a pretty good fella. You know why? Because he's not close to God. When the most righteous man that ever lived got close to God, his name was Job, and he was the most righteous man that ever lived. When he got close to God, he cried and said, Well, I'll have to show you. <laughs> Job chapter 41. Now look at Job 41. This is what the most righteous man cried and said when he got close to God. That shows you the sinner doesn't think he's a sinner because he's not close to God. And if he'd get close to God, he'd see that he was a sinner going to hell and he'd cry out for mercy because of his sins. Look at Job. Job chapter 41. And um, Job chapter 42, rather. Job chapter 42. And uh, uh, verse uh, 5, Job 42, 5. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye, what? See thee. Now that's Job. 
Now, was Job a pretty good fella? I mean, really, Job. You talk about a fella that's good. Man, he was good, wasn't he, Brother Martin? You couldn't, I mean, if you compared yourself to Job, brother, you couldn't come up to his shoelaces. That fellow was righteous. That fellow was holy. That fellow was right. But until he seen God face to face, he didn't know what kind of sinner he was. But when he come face to face with God and saw God, then this is what he says. Look at verse, the rest of verse 5. Uh, but my eye has seen him. Verse 6. Wherefore, I, what? Abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Then when a man gets close to God, and gets close to God, and gets closer to God, and closer to God, and closer to God, he sees how sinful he is. He sees how wicked he is. He doesn't see his own holiness. He sees God's holiness. He sees his own sinfulness. So the closer you get to God, you're going to see that you're a sinner. That's why you said amen. And that's why the unsaved man does not say amen. Because he's a sinner and he don't even see it. My brother Gary, he's an atheist. How many of you prayed for my brother Gary to get saved? Raise your hand. Thank you. I'm, 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 I want this whole church, I want this whole church, everybody in it to say, to pray for my brother Gary, he's going to hell. And you say, that's selfish. Okay, selfish. Will you pray that he goes to he heaven instead of to hell? Will you, will you, will you please do that? You got a prayer list? You got a prayer list? Did you write down somewhere prayers? And you got a prayer list? Write Gary Bemis, lost and going to hell. God, please save him. You said selfish. Yeah, but I want to see him in heaven. He was sitting back there in the church, listening to me preach. And I preached at him. I preached right at him, you know. He said, you're preaching at me, Nathan. <laughs> and that's true. I was. And preached the whole sermon, got through with the sermon, walked back there. Gary said to me, Nathan, that's all good and fine. And he's an atheist. He said, that's all good and fine. Puffs his chest out like this and says, I'm just not a sinner. Why did an atheist that's gone to hell say, I'm not a sinner? Because he's far from God. He's not close to God. When a man gets close to God, he doesn't say that. Prove it to you. Take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of Luke. I'll give it to you again. I'll get to Romans in a minute. Take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of Luke and turn to Luke chapter 18. Oh, that God would show the sinner that he's a sinner. Oh, that God would show the lost man that his sins are taking him to hell. You know something, if I could just get me a good-fashioned, old-fashioned sinner and find me an old-fashioned sinner, I could get him saved. Is there a sinner in the crowd that's lost? I got a message for you. Sinners are hard to find, boy. Hard to find. It's hard to get them lost. If you get a man lost, you can get him saved. You just can't get him lost. I was preaching in my church one day and I said, Oh, for a lost sinner that's gone to hell. Boy, I preached hell hot and sin black and they turned it along. And I looked back and said, Your sins are taking you to hell. That man bowed his head and started crying. I give the invitation, and he ran the aisle. He ran it. He ran the aisle. I mean, he ran down that aisle like that, run down there, got down there and, and started bawling and crying, and got down there with him, and he prayed and asked Jesus to come into his heart and save him. He trusted in the blood of Jesus. Now, why did he run the aisle? Because he saw he was a sinner and he was lost and going to hell. That's why. So what do you got to do? You got to say, God, open up his eyes and show him he's a sinner. I can't do that. You can't do that. Only God can do that. Only God can show a man he is a sinner. So every time you deal with somebody, you bow your head and say, Lord, show him he's a sinner. 
Oh, God, show him he's lost and going to hell. Oh, God, open up his heart and show him that and reveal it to him. Then he's ready to get saved, not before then. All right. Look at Luke chapter 18. Are you there? Say amen. amen. All right. In Luke chapter 18, it says, uh, And it come to pass. Uh, no. Where is that? Well, two men went up to the... T- one, uh, uh, two men went up to the temple to pray. Verse 10. All right. Two men went up to the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. What's his problem? It's inward. I. I'm not as other men are. What is that? He didn't see his badness. He didn't see his sin. He didn't see his wickedness. He said, I thank you that I'm not as other men are. He sees his own righteousness. You can't be saved by your own righteousness. You can't be saved by how good you are. The man don't get saved. Man doesn't get saved. Watch it again. All right. Uh... Luke chapter 18, verse uh, 11. And it says, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. An extortioner. He says, I'm not an extortioner. Now, you, what's, what's extortion? That's getting money, being crooked. Unjust. He's not unjust. An adulterer. He's not an adulterer. Even as this publican. Boy, he could sure lamb blast that guy, though, couldn't he? I mean, he nailed the publican. <laughs> he had enough to get the other guy, but he has nothing about his own, his own righteousness. <sighs> I'm a Baptist. I'm a Methodist. I'm a Presbyterian. I was out knocking on the door Saturday, last uh, Saturday before I come over here, and I was knocking on the door, and this old man comes to the door, and I looked at him and said, hi, good afternoon. We talked, chit-chat a little bit about the sky and around a little bit. And I said, we come here to ask you a personal question. Are you going to go to heaven? And this man, this old fellow said, yeah, uh, I hope so. And I said, if you died today and you got up into heaven and you wanted to go through the gates of heaven... What would you tell the Lord to get you in the gates of heaven? And this fellow says, I've been a good Methodist. You, you've been the good Methodist. You know some what kind of answer is that? That's the wrong answer. Tell them so. Tell them so. Next time somebody says, I've been a good Catholic. Tell him he'd give the wrong answer. Suppose he says, I've been a good Baptist. Tell him he gave the wrong answer. What's the right answer? The right answer is, I'm trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ to get me to heaven. That's the right answer. But an unsaved man can't see that. He can't see that. He needs somebody to open up his eyes and show him. Now, Luke chapter 18, and notice what it says in verse 11. It said, not even as this publican, verse 12, and I fast twice in a week. He fasts two days in a week, he fasted. And I give tithes of all that I possess. Then what was that man doing? He was self-righteous. He could only see himself. He never got a vision of God. He never saw God. He doesn't see salvation. And he's not justified. He goes to hell in that state. Why? He's self-righteous. That's men's problem. Now look what happens. Verse 13. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes to heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now watch it. Watch what it says. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. 
So you know the first thing is your in fact is you're on one side. You're on the side with the lost man going to hell, and even if you're self-righteous, and even if you have your own religion, and even if you have baptism, you're on a complete different side than the other fellow. I'm on this side, you're on this side. There's a great gap between the two of us. What side are you on? All right. Now, take your Bible and turn to the book of Romans and turn to Romans chapter 5. Turn to Romans chapter 5. There's a great gap between them. And there's only two groups of people in this world. There's the saved and there's the lost. That's the only two groups there are. Saved and lost. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Turn to Romans chapter 5. You know why people go to hell? You know why people go to hell? Now look at me. They go to hell because they don't get contacted with that book right there. They have no contact with that book. The Bible says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God. So how does a man get faith? By the Word of God. The Bible says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Then a man is born again by that book. Then why does a man go to hell? He don't get connected with the Bible. So what's happening to the Christians? Knock on the door. And somebody comes to the door. Some man comes to the door. Or some woman knocks on the door, you knock on the door like that, and they come to the door, and you got your Bible. I keep my Bible two places. I keep it hid back here. I keep it hid back there, or I keep it hid right here for just a few seconds or a few minutes. You say, what for? The Bible scares everybody to death. The Bible scares them to death. So I talk a little bit. And then all of a sudden I reach in here like that and I jerk this thing out like this and I take this thing out like this and the whole conversation changes. Something takes place. Because this is a living book. It liveth and abideth forever. This is a two-edged sword that cuts a man. This is what gives a man eternal life. Then I take that book and open up that book and then I say, now look and read that verse. That's how a man gets saved. How many of you want to win a soul? Yeah. The Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Now, is his soul viable? What does it mean for him to lose his own soul? It means that one of these days, God Almighty in Revelation chapter 20, take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 20. What does it mean for a man to lose his own soul? What about this sinner that's going to go to hell and his soul be lost? Turn to Revelation chapter 20 and look at verse 15. And it says, according to God's holy book, Revelation 20, 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, was what, folks? Cast into the lake of fire. Then what's going to happen to him? He's going to go to hell. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 14. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 14. Pick up verse 10. Revelation 14, 10. Revelation 14, 10. See what's going to happen to that man who is cast into the lake of fire. You know what you want to do to win a soul? Remember as many gospel tracts. You've got a bunch of gospel tracts in there. Everybody ought to go over here and get at least one gospel tract of every sort that's there and go home and put those gospel tracts down and start memorizing all the scriptures that's in them gospel tracts and remember every single scripture that's in them gospel tracts till you know them backwards and forwards and forwards and backwards and better than you know your first name. What for? A soul is more valuable than anything in the face of this earth. 
More valuable than a hundred brand new Cadillacs or a Mercedes Benz or a, what's that car we saw today? A Jaguar. Have you ever priced a Jaguar? His soul's more valuable than a dozen Jaguars. Because the Jaguars are go up in that big old truck that flattens all the cars out on a big old flat truck, and they go out of here on a flat truck, and they're about that big. That's where the Jaguar will end up. Oh, yes, it will! But the soul goes on in eternity with Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. You can do that. And now's the time to do it while they're young. And while they're young, before sin just grabs a hold of them and they reject Christ a thousand times and they're so hard and stiff that they don't want to receive Jesus Christ. Get them while they're still young and, and they got a will that's not all hammered with sin. The time to get saved is when you're young. Don't wait till a man gets old to try to win him. Win him when he's a teenager. Win him when he's young. Be a soul winner. You can be one. Oh, if somebody had witnessed me when I was 12 years old, I wanted to walk the aisle when I was 12 years old. I almost did when I was 12. If I had another 12-year-old boy say to me, Nathan, you ought to get saved. Boy, wouldn't it have been a difference. I had to wait till I was 19. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. What does it say? The same shall drink. You in Revelation 20, 10, say amen. 20, 20, 10? No, the 14, 10. 1410. I'll get it in a minute. Does he do that? I hope he does. Revelation 14:10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. It's without mixture because there's no grace in it. There's no mercy in it. It's just pure wrath. It's pure wrath. One of these days he's going to drink the wrath of God. And there'll be no mercy in it, no grace in it, and he will drink that wrath and he will burn forever because he sinned against an eternal God. That's why he burns forever in hell. Because God's eternal. And God is holy. Does God have to put a man in hell? Now, you know, I wouldn't have to. Because I'm unholy. And I'm sinful. I could just say, well, let's just forget the whole mess and let's just let him go to heaven anyway. Because I'm unholy. I don't have to be just. I don't have to be right. I don't have to be holy. But God has to be holy and God's got to put him in hell for his own righteousness and his own holiness. You follow me? And the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment is sended up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night. You know what that is? That's hell. Then his torment... He's going to be tormented every morning, tormented every afternoon, tormented every evening, tormented every midnight, tormented 24 hours a day for eternity. And there'll be no rest from that torment. You can't imagine what I just said. You cannot imagine that. If you really had a vision of hell... You with me also could not stand this life. If we really had a vision of hell, we would say, Oh God, oh God, oh God, what am I doing? But hell is still true. He is going to burn. Your sister is going to burn. Your mother is going to burn. Your daddy's going to burn. Your children are going to burn in hell if they're not saved. telling you the truth. 
There's a great gap between them. Take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of John. And turn to John chapter 17. Turn to John chapter 17. Pick up verse 21. The Gospel of John chapter 17. Pick up verse 21. And see what the Holy Scripture says about a Christian now. This is way over on the other side. He's saved, man. He's saved. John chapter 17. All right, I'll give you a chance to get there. Take me a second. This is a new Bible. I can't get used to it. John chapter 17. Let's pick up verse 21. If you're there in John 17, 21, say amen. amen. All right, it says, That they all may be what? One, uh, uh, as thou, Father, art in me, who's talking? Jesus Christ. And I in thee, that they also be one with what? With what? One with what? Folks, say it again. One with us. So you know where you are? You're one with God Almighty. You're in Jesus Christ. You're bone of his bone. You're flesh of his flesh. You're in God. Yes! I'm not only in God. I'm already in heaven. I have left this earth and I'm going in the presence of Jesus Christ right now. I'm seated together with Him in heavenly places. I'm already in glory. You say, preacher, yes. I got His righteousness too. You do too. You got the right... Well, I'll show it to you. Take your Bible and turn to 2 Corinthians. Turn to 2 Corinthians. And turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. There's a great difference between a saved man and a lost man. They are not anywhere close alike. Whose side are you on? Now I'm talking about the side of the Christian. Here's the Christian. I'm talking about his side. That's me. I'm on this side, brother. I'm on the side with the saved. I'm on the side with the born again. And the lost man is over here. He's lost. He's dead in trespasses and sin. He's going to hell. He's on the road that goes to hell. There's a great gap between them. We're not close. We're not a bit close. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You there? Come on, folks. Turn to the verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us. When did God make Jesus Christ sin for us on the cross of Calvary? When 2,000 years ago, it's been 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ hung on the cross of Calvary, and God the Father took my sin and put it on Jesus Christ, and He took your sin and put it on Jesus Christ, and every man in this building, He took His sin. Thank God, thank God, thank God! And He put it on Him, and He became sin. My sin, your sin, my sin. You see, who's my sin? Nathan White Bemis, my sins, mine. They belong to me, they're mine. And he took them, and he became my sin. Was buried in the grave for three days and three nights, and took my sins and put them in hell. And then he arose from the grave. How many believe Jesus Christ arose from the grave? Amen. He come up alive. He's alive. And then he ascended up to heaven and he's sitting on the right hand of the throne of God and he did that for me. Say amen. amen. Now watch what it says. All right. Uh, for he hath made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? Jesus Christ knew no sin. He didn't sin. He never sinned in his entire life. He never sinned. And he becomes sin for me to get keep my soul out of hell so I don't have to pay for my own sins. Now watch it. That 
we might be made the what? The righteousness of who? God. Did you know what happens? There's a trade takes place. I traded him my sins and he gave me his righteousness. And I got it as a free gift. Now tell me something. If I've got the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which the Bible says I do, so I do, my soul is A-OK. And so is yours. But look at the gap between the two. Look at the gap between the two. The lost man has no righteousness of God whatsoever. All he has is his own righteousness. That's all he's got. It will not get him past the judgment of God. One of these days you're going to drop dead. If you're a sinner, you're going to drop dead. You're going to stop breathing. And then your soul is going to step out of your body into hell. And then one of these days God's going to resurrect that soul and bring you up and judge you. And then you'll have that great judgment day come on. Now you're on one side or the other. Whose side are you on? I'm on the Lord's side. Whose side are you on? Take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. That's where I was going to go a minute ago. <laughs> Amen? Romans chapter 5. Here we go again. Lord willing, I'll get there this time. <laughs> Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Pick up verse 6. You say, what does a sinner have to do? A sinner has to be exposed to that book. Exposed to that book. Exposed to that book. And the more gospel tracts you give to a man, because they got the word of God in them, the more chances he can get saved. You know what I do when I knock on the door? I put three or four of uh, Brother Art Martin's tracts in there. Three or four of them. And I put three or four more from some other else. And I got about eight or nine tracts. And I got a little uh, thing my wife sells Avon. And so I get an Avon bag and I fill it full of tracks. <laughs> fill it full of tracks. And then I go around on the door and knock on the door and nobody's home. I put that Avon bag there and I hide it with the track there so you can't tell what's in it but Avon. So they say, oh, a wonderful thing for Mrs. Avon. Then they open it up and they reach in there and it says, if you die and go to hell, who cares? <gasps> And then that don't work. So they put that aside. And then reach in and grab another one, and that don't work. It goes aside. And you reach in and you grab that one, and it don't work. It goes aside. And you reach in the one, and all of a sudden, there it is. Blam! He's exposed to that book right there. When you plant a roll of corn, when you plant a roll of corn, do you, anybody ever plant corn? Anybody ever plant any corn? Have you ever planted peas? Radishes? Turn up, you ever plant a garden? Do you just put one, one corn in there and then go up about four feet and put one more? Or do you put three or four in there? Or three or four in this little hill and go up a little bit further and put three or four more in that little hill and go up a little bit further and put three or four. Why? Because you're figuring that one of them's not going to come up. Or maybe two of them's not going to come up. And you want to have a whole roll in there. So put four, five, or six, or seven tracks in each one of them when you go down there. You say, what for? One of them might bring forth the seed. Said the saw went forth to sow the seed. And some of it fell by the wayside. Some of it fell on stony ground. Some of it fell among the thorns. But bless God, glory, hallelujah, some fell on a good heart. It fought forth a hundredfold, or sixtyfold, or thirtyfold. But be a sower that go forth and go the seed. Be a sower. Be a sower. Be a sower. Go forth and sow the seed. You say, well, I, I can't do that. Yeah, you can. Take a bunch of tracks with you when you go somewhere or another. Go up telephone book. Put some on the telephone. When you go over to the library, you know what I do? I go to the library, and I go to the library, and I pretend I'm reading. And I reach in my track, reach in my pocket like that, take a stack, and I stick it right down in there like that. And then I put the back back in the shelf, and I go over here somewhere, get another one, Reach in my pocket and reach in there, pretend I'm reading, stick it in like that, and put it back up on the shelf. And you say, what's it for? Some poor sinner in the tribulation or somewhere, and the Lord says, I want you to get saved. Go into the library and go up and get this book. 
Don't you think the Lord can do that? I believe the Lord can do that. I don't believe it's a problem with him. It's called a track line. Go into Kmart. Go into Kmart. Open up the coffee lid. Got a little rubber thing around it, you know. Got a little rubber thing around that. And stick it under there and put it down. They've been searching for me for a long time. They ain't caught me yet, though. They said, Brother Bemis, be careful. The men, they're looking for you all over Kmart. They're going to have to catch me. Stick it in. You know what you do? You try a coat on. You try a coat on. As you try a coat on, you stick a track right there in the coat pocket right there. And then you put the coat back on the rack. And there's that track in there, in that coat pocket. You say, what are you doing? Somebody, and you know, I had a lady call me up on the phone and says, I resent you coming in my door and putting it right on my table. I said, I said, no, Lord, how did it get on her table? I didn't put it on her table, but I know how it got on her table. I went up to the newspaper and I put a whole slug of them in the newspaper. And the newspaper sent them out. And the newspaper sent them out everywhere. And some, her husband probably said, I got her. He took it out and slid it out of the newspaper and set it on the table. And she come in screaming mad. I think the problem was the Lord was just saying, here's one more chance. Here's one more chance. Here's one more chance. Romans chapter 5. I interrupt myself all the time. <laughs> Romans chapter 5. Are you there? I'm not there. Romans chapter 5. Now I'll show you something about a man going to hell. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, look at verse 6. Verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, in due time, now underline it in your Bible, Christ died for the what? Okay, now write this down. How many got a piece of paper? How many got a piece of paper? Take your piece of paper. Write something down. There's two things you got to believe to be saved. There's two things you got to believe and one thing you got to do. Two things you got to believe and one thing you got to do. Number one, you got to believe that you're a sinner and can't save yourself. Amen? If I could just show him as a sinner, show him he's a sinner. Number two, number two. You say, do you believe you're a sinner and can't save yourself? Yes. Number two, the second thing you've got to believe is that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. That's the second thing you've got to believe. You've got to show him that. It says, Christ died for who? Who did he die for? The ungodly. Show him that from the scripture. That Christ died for the ungodly. Two things you got to believe, one thing you got to do. Now, do you believe Jesus Christ died for the ungodly? Died for your sins, was buried and rose again? Say amen. amen. You've done the first two. There's something you got to do. Two things you got to believe, one thing you got to do. Now, what's the thing you got to do? The thing you got to do is receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That's what you got to do. You got to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You say, I resent that. Then you'll go to hell if you resent it. You say, I don't like that. You'll burn, baby, burn if you don't receive Him. There's only one way to heaven. And the one way is the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's no other way. Amen. Do you folks believe that there's only one way to heaven? Amen. Really, really believe that? Man, man, narrow-minded, bigoted bunch of people. Only, only one way? Yes, only one way. You say, what are you saying? That means everybody else is wrong. You see, where'd you get that from? I got that from the Holy Bible. I got that from the Holy Scriptures. There's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. 
He's the only way. There's only one name given among heaven whereby we must be saved. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ and there's no other name. You see, that's narrow-minded and bigoted. Yes, it is, but you can't get to heaven any other way. You, why is that? Because Jesus Christ was God's Son. That's why. All right, Romans chapter 5, verse 6, verse 7 says, uh, Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verse 6, verse 7 now, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet, pre-eventually, for a good man, some would even dare to die. Now, what's that saying? That's saying, would you die for me? Maybe, maybe not. Would I die for you? Well, maybe, maybe not. Come on. Would I die for you if you was out there drowning? And you was drowning in the lake? And I saw you drowning? Would I die for you? Yeah, yeah that's true. Maybe, maybe not. Actually die. Would I die in your place? Now I hope if my son was sitting there, John, and I'd say I'd die for him. Look what it said. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet pre-eventually for a good man some would even dare to die. He's saying not too many people would die for somebody else. You see that? All right, verse 8. But God commanded his love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood. Justified by what? His blood. His blood. That's what justifies a man. We shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were what? Everybody say it. I'm on this side. I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. And this man over here is lost. And who is he according to what you just read? He's what? He's the enemy of God. The enemy of God. God's enemy. God's going to take him and God's going to put his enemy in hell. You say, how's he the, how in the world is God so good to folks then if he's the enemy of God? Why is God so good to him? Because God is good to evil people. God is good to wicked people. God is good to people that goes to hell and God is a good God. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse 35. Luke chapter 6, verse 35. The Gospel of Luke. You know why you you know why uh, God's so good to American people? I believe it's because how they started out. Luke uh, chapter 6, verse 35. Americans, God just been good to Americans and given them good cars and good houses and good food and I mean, you can buy so much junk in America that it's pathetic. Say amen. amen. Come on. You can go down the store and you say, man, that thing is just full of stores. I mean, it goes pumped to the ceiling full of stuff. You don't do that in Russia. No, sir, boy, you don't go in the stores of Russia and see the stuff stacked to the ceiling. I don't know if you got those kind of stores around here, but I went one out there in Washington, and man, they stacked them with the forklift up. Boy, I mean, that junk was just stacked on piles of junk on top of junk up to the ceiling, and you could go into store after store after store. Oh, God is good to America. Amen, Amen he's good to them. And some, a whole bunch of them are going to hell like a bullet. He's still good to them. Uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 35. But love your enemies and do good. Land hope for nothing again and your reward shall be great. Ye shall be children of the highest. Now watch what it says. For he is what, folks? He's what? Kind. 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 Who's kind? God is kind. God is kind. He is kind unto who? 
The unthankful sinner gone to hell and God is kind to him. God will give him a new car. God will give him a new house. God will give him a couple of million in the bank and he's still going to hell. God's kind to him. Just because you've got a nice house and got a nice car and got a bunch of nice clothes, God is kind. You can still break up in hell and wake up screaming for God's mercy. He's kind unto the unthankful and to the what? To the evil. So what's God do? The, the lesbians and the queers march down the street and blaspheme God and they're full of sin from the top of the head to the bottom of the toe and their wickedness has been against them since God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and he's given that witness for since then and it's still here today. You say, what's God feel about it? He burned to crisp. That's what he feels about it. But he's kind and good to them. Gives them nice clothes, nice cars to drive, and an airplane to fly. And lets them be doctors and lawyers. Oh, yes, he does. Yes, he does. But one of these days, God's kindness and God's mercy and God's loving kindness is going to run out. Because you've rejected his son and then you'll wake up in hell screaming for God's mercy. You can get the mercy and the grace and the kindness of God right now. Why don't you get it? Why don't you get it? You know how you get it? You get it by fearing God. You get it by fearing God. You get it by Romans chapter 10. You get it. Oh, no, I've got to show it to you. Take your Bible. One more verse. Turn to Romans chapter 10. How does he get on the right side? He gets on the right side by fearing God. He gets on the right side by believing God. He gets on the right side by saying yes to God. Here it is. Romans chapter 10. Are you there? Say amen. amen. And Romans chapter 10. Let's pick up verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. Now the next three words, this is how he gets off of the side, off of the wrong side and gets on the right side. Now read the next words. What does it say? Have not, what's that word right there? Submitted. So take your pen and underline it. Have not Submitted, submitted, submitted to submitted. So what has he got to do? He's got to submit to God's righteousness and he's got to say yes to God. I can't save myself. He's got to submit. But if he's stubborn and proud and says he's not a sinner, he'll walk out that door lost and still going to hell because he thinks he's righteous and he's a sinner. So what's he got to do? He's got to submit to God. He's got to say, okay, Lord. Okay, Lord. I believe that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. You believe that? Do you believe you're a sinner and can't save yourself? That's number one. Do you believe Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, was buried in the grave for three days and three nights, and arose for your sins? That's why he died. Yours. Okay? Now will you receive him as your personal Savior? That's what the gospel invitation is. The gospel invitation is for you as a lost sinner to receive Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross of Calvary. Will you change your mind about sin and change your mind about Jesus Christ? That's repentance. Now the invitation is get up out of your seat and come. There's people that will show you how to be saved right here at this old-fashioned altar. They got a Bible. They can show you how to be saved. They'll show you and point you right to Jesus in that Bible. But you got to come. They can't make you come. God won't make you come. And I can't make you come. You got to come because you say yes to God. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. I ask you, whose side you on? It's the difference between heaven and hell. Heaven is on one side, hell is on the other. It's the difference between dying in your sins and dying in Jesus Christ. 
one or the other. There's no in-between. Now, which one is it for you? You say, preacher, I, I agree. I've never done that. Okay, tonight's your night. Will you receive him? There's people praying right now in their hearts. There's people praying right now saying, Lord, please save so-and-so. Please save so-and-so. Now, nobody can do that for you but you. So if you will, it's not an invitation to get baptized. That's not the invitation. It's not an invitation to join the church. That's not the invitation. The invitation is you to receive Jesus Christ in what he did for you on the cross of Calvary. He died for your sins. It's a substitutionary death. He died in your place. Will you accept his death as a payment for your sin? That's the invitation. I can't make it any clearer than that. Let's sing hymn number... 386. 386 in your hymnal. the Bible says? The Bible says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. You say, preacher, is it that simple? Yes, it's that simple. It's free. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. It's a free gift. No baptism, no church membership. It's free for the asking. Will you ask? Will you ask? Ask him right now. Step out of your seat and come. Step out of your seat and come as we sing. I know why you won't come. I know why you won't come. You know why you won't come? Because you're afraid. You're afraid. You're afraid of what somebody else will think. The Bible says the fear of man bringeth a snare. Don't you be afraid of what somebody else thinks. You need to be afraid of God. Fear Him. Because He can take and put your soul in hell forever. I wouldn't turn Jesus Christ down just because somebody else around me think, well, well, what are they going to think of me? I'll tell you what they think of you. They're saying, oh, I wish they'd get saved. Oh, I wish they'd get saved. Oh, I would just shout within my heart if they'd get saved. Amen. See, that's what they're thinking. Will you come? Will you come? Come on. Step out of your seat and come. Somebody will pray with you right down here. You can go from heaven to hell right there. You go from light to darkness, right there. You can come from lost to saved, right there, just like that. But you've got to come. Will you come?
would like to ask you to bow your heads and I want to make it just a little bit easier on you tonight. That is, if God has squeezed on your heart, this is so very, very, very important. Please don't go out of here lost. No shame to come in lost, but it's certainly a shame to come in lost, hear a message like this, and go out lost. If God has spoken your heart and you're not absolutely certain of your salvation, nobody looking around, Christians doing no more than praying. Why don't you just slip right out of your seat, come this way, let me get somebody to take a Bible, and let's get it guaranteed tonight. This is not a game, this is not a religious show. Please, would you come? If you're not sure of your salvation, you come. I'm going to ask Shirley to play just another verse through, just quietly as Christians are praying. Would you slip out of your seat and come? God has dealt with you. You can be thankful for it. You've heard the gospel. You can be thankful for it. You have an opportunity to get saved. Don't miss it. Please come. Are you sure of your salvation? If not, please step out and come. A little time. Would you come? Are you sure? If I ask you to slip your hand up as a testimony before God, that I know it's well with my soul. I remember the time. I remember the place. I'm sure of my salvation. Could you do it? If you could not, I'm not going to ask you to do it, but if you could not, you need to come. Please come, would you come? A few more seconds here, you step out, we've got all night. We are concerned about your soul, about yourself. I trust you let the Lord speak to your heart deal with you Christians and wonderful to see somebody get saved tonight but not here can't do nothing about it got a few more nights why don't you get with it do your best bring somebody around perhaps in this meeting there might be two or three that would get saved but they got to be here they got to hear it Lord's been good to us. We're thankful for the preaching of the Word of God. And would you consider coming back? Come back tomorrow night, Friday night. Great opportunity to come to church. Good singing, preaching. Saturday night, likewise, you won't do no better. And let's pray. Let's give God a chance to really turn this place loose. This is the area where we need work more than any place else to win some souls to the Lord. Keep your heads bowed in closing prayer, Brother Rick George.